nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. This presentation will give you an, in, an introduction of the NEMO 3D tool. In principle, what some of its numerics are, what it can handle, what kind of structures. It won't give you any science results, but just sort of an overview of what the tool itself is. Oops. So the agenda really is to that we wanted to model quantum dots or structures alike and calculate the eigenstates of the system and map those into realistic properties that people could measure, like absorption coefficients, like transition lines, like uh, even somewhat uh, IV curves. Uh, although it's a truly only an electronic structure code, it does not have transport. And the key element that we learned of NEMO 1D is that you cannot do nanoelectronics with just effective mass, or continuum models for that matter. At 2, 3, 4, 5 nanometers, the number of atoms in that dimension is countable. So you have to have an atomistic representation. And if you want to do that, you can do either pseudopotentials or local orbitals. Pseudopotentials are wonderful, but they're generally used in infinitely periodic structures. So my devices that I'm interested in are, have finite extent, are not periodic, so I'm going to use a local orbital approach. And I'm interested in semiconductors that are stable. I'm interested in semiconductor device, I can use uh, structures that I can use in devices. And if a bond were flopping back and forth and changing over time, and re-establishing itself and establishing itself all the time, it would probably be a bad semiconductor device. Let me turn that around. I need to know where the atoms are and how they're bonded. That's it. I don't need to establish how they're, that they're bonded. So I don't need necessarily an ab initio calculation that establishes the geometry and does an all-electron calculation. So I can focus on the conduction and the valence bands, and I can throw out a lot of information that is included in ab initio. That allows us to go to a million atoms. So the art is in the cutting. How much do you cut out? And from day one, we said we're writing a parallel code. It's not, let's write a prototype in, in serial and, and patch parallelism into it. But it was built in the fundamental thinking that we will write a parallel code because we knew we weren't going to compute this on a serial machine. So we do this in tight binding. And at JPL, I spent a lot of time developing a genetic algorithm to really fit tight binding to experimental and theoretical data. Meaning, we establish the basis to experimental data, and then we store that basis and don't mess with it. And when we do different devices, we just use that basis. Okay? And it needs to be a basis that's exact in terms of, excuse me, gap, effective masses, X points, gamma points, L points, depending on the material. Okay? And these ab initio models that are mostly out there, in a form that they compute larger structures, they don't even get the gap right. But I'm designing my design device on a 100 mL volt, 200 mL volt gap, uh, conduction band edge offsets, for example, and confinement. If my gap is off by, by half an AV, I don't have anything, okay? And the ab initio methods that scale, to, that do that right, can do 50 atoms and run for a week on a supercomputer or run for a week on a, on a normal computer, okay? So it doesn't work. So we have to have something that can do millions of atoms and gets the gaps and the, the masses right. And tight binding can do that. <laughs> 
and it can handle the strain. And we developed a bunch of algorithms that allowed us to do that. So at the end, about three years ago, four years ago, we demonstrated a calculation of 52 million atoms electronic structure calculation. 52 million atoms is roughly 100 by 100 by 100 nanometers in chunk size. Sounds like a small chunk, but it's a modern field tr effect transistor put in. Every atom. Or it's a stack of quantum dots. So it's a, it's a pretty big chunk. And that would run on 20, 128 cores for about 34 hours. So that was a hero experiment. We don't do that on a day-to-day -day basis. My students operate typically at roughly 48, 64 cores for 10 hours, and they do calculations for 10 million atoms on a day-to-day -day basis. That's our workhorse, how we work most of the time. So the basis is that we represent a, a crystal in structure explicitly. We assume symmetries of basis states. We use S, P, and D orbitals. And we assume that there's couplings between these orbitals and neighbors. That is done in this uh, sp 3 star d 5 model. It has each atom has four nearest neighbors. So here's a typical zinc blender crystal. And this is how the Hamiltonian would look. Right? You, you loop through the atoms, and then you loop through the orbitals, and you have diagonal matrix elements, and you have coupling matrix elements from, for each neighbor. And for unit cells like that, we represent gallium arsenide and indium arsenide, and we typically use the sp3d5 model rather than the sp3s star model, because we can get the strain better, we get the valence bands better, and we get the excited states better. So, if I have a 52 million atom system, that's a matrix of the order of 10 to the 9 by 10 to the 9. A billion by a billion. Don't try that with paper and pencil. Okay? The interactions between the neighbors are scaled by angles, in a sense here with these representation of um, um, cosines, directional cosines, and as a function of distance <coughs> where we modulate the distance uh, as a function of parameter uh, for the, each orbital as a parameter. Here is the general co computational flow in NEMO 3D. We define a structure, a geometry in an input deck. We construct the geometry in three-dimensional space of connecting atoms, putting them in a, effectively a mesh but basically placing one atom at a time and relating it to its neighbors. Then we consider these points in space as balls on spring. We use this so-called valence force field method where basically the balls are sitting on a spring and they can relax. Then we freeze those guys in space. They don't move. Typically, then we construct a Hamiltonian and calculate the eigenvalues and get output. Sometimes we, from the strain, derive a piezoelectric potential, feed that into the Hamiltonian, or we come in externally and feed in an electrical or magnetic field that will influence this Hamiltonian and then calculate the eigenstates in that system and move on. All right, so here is this VFF calculation. Why would you do that? So gallium arsenide and indium arsenide have very different lattice constants. In fact, that's why these quantum dots self-assemble, because they have very different lattice constants. 